expected and uh, roughed up last week against Florida, so it's a big week for him tonight. Let's get things underway right away. Prager comes dealing to Amani Larry, leadoff man for Mississippi State, as you can take a look at this lineup. And David Mershon, according to head coach Chris Limonis, he says Mershon plays with his hair on fire. He's sort of the party starter, if you will, in this lineup. Behind those big bats behind him, he'll hit second behind the DH Amani Larry. And defensively, we'll get into it, but Larry playing DH means that Dylan Cup is going to start at shortstop tonight for Mississippi State. That's a big deal for them defensively. Prager ahead on the count 0 2, and he puts one in the dirt. Yeah, Prager hits the dirt, it's on purpose. Just give Armani Larry a different look on an 0 2 count. Try to see if he'll swing and miss, and then comes up high, changing the eye angles for the hitter. Larry takes 2 2. Now you see the tilt. On that fastball coming over the top for Prager, and that barely missed the bottom of the strike zone. It's a tough take. Took something off it. Strikes out Amani Larry. When Ryan Prager shows you what he's capable of, I mean, he can throw about any any pitch in any count. There you see the slider. Left-handers only hit 226 off Prager. Right-handers 148. So Ryan Prager carves up the right-handers, which is unusual from the left side. Now the switch hitting David Mershon steps in. It's the inside corner, strike one. Look at Mershon. He's got all kinds of stuff working there. He's got the hoodie underneath. He's got the elbow guard. He's got the tights. And he's hitting 380 on the year. Swings right through that offering. He's down 0-2. Yeah, that that swing shows you he's looking for something off speed from Prager. He's behind the fastball. And that's what more of a credit to Ryan Prager. I mean, he's so smart on the mound. He can think along with the hitter. And that's the big chess game you have between the hitter and pitcher. It's the educated guess on what pitch is coming. Prager ahead 0-2 to the second consecutive hitter. Again, waste one there trying to get Mershon to chase. He doesn't a ball in two strikes. Yeah, that wasn't as competitive as he would have liked, but you saw the same pitch on 0-2 to Wani Larry. Ryan Prager's trying to get it low in the zone, try to get a swing and miss, and then he'll come back with something middle in or up high. Mershon swings through it again. Two batters, two strikeouts for Prager. We already know how good this Texas A&M offense is. If they can get some, some pitching to go along with it. Ryan Prager, look, over the top. Takes a little something off of it. David Mershon way out in front. But if they can get some pitching going, this team is going to be really hard to beat. And now the dangerous Dakota Jordan. You highlighted him in the top. Takes low ball one. He's not so dangerous when nobody's on base in front of him, and that's the key to get the guys out. With nobody on, now you can attack him. His numbers are off the charts everywhere you look. <laughs> Swings through it for strike one. And what you love about Ryan Prager, too, is he can manipulate the fastball. I mean, he, he, he does have a changeup, but he throws more of a BP fastball that you saw in the last at bat to Mershon, and then that one. He just gets behind it, throws some heat right past one of the best hitters in the country. Got that little outside corner. Yeah, strikes that's two. And that's not a take on the location. Dakota George looking for something off speed. And you got the threat of something off speed. You come back with that. That's what gets the freeze from the hitter. And again, another reason Ryan Prager's so good. Ball and two strikes to Dakota Jordan. Prager again bounces that one up there, even in the count of two apiece. Yeah, 
really trying to get on top of that slider and really break it off and just throws it too hard and chokes it. A little over amped up, maybe a little bit at the start of the game. Yeah, but even for him, he's still under control. Gets the third strikeout, but it gets away from the catcher. Appel, he's going to have to chase it down, and there's no way he's going to throw out Dakota Jordan. So three consecutive strikes, uh, strikeouts to start the game, but Dakota Jordan reaches base. And one, two on all three hitters. Up. Yeah, I mean, Prager just works ahead. That's what's so fantastic. How nasty is this? Again, you're looking at a hitter hit 418. One of the best hitters, he misses it by three feet. Just bites in the dirt, but Appel not able to hold on to it. Ooh, the wild pitch. Jordan's on first base. This will bring up Hunter Hines. And again, Prager gets ahead in the count. But Hines last weekend, three home runs in that series at LS, against LSU. Yeah, and that's one of the best pitching staffs in the country LSU has. They brought into Starkville last year. And State just hurt their feelings in a big way. Again, Prager with the off-speed pitch and finding the strike zone with it. Go to once again. Four strikeouts in the top of the first inning. Top six home runs. And he has 25 RBIs on the year. Watches a fastball go by. Oh, and he gets a hold of this one and sends it to left field. All the way back and gone. He does have a little bit of pop in that bat. Extremely difficult to get on the field nowadays as a freshman, but Gavin Grohovac has no problem. By perfect game, he was one of the top ten outfielders in the country in high school last year. He's only a freshman. Remember, he's playing third base today, but man, has he got a lot of pop. Seventh home run for Gavin. Gets a fastball, actually a slider, out over the plate. It looked like it was on the outside corner. He goes out, reaches for it, gets a good barrel on it, pops it to left. The ball is carrying a little bit to left field. one nothing Aggies. So you, you give up a, a leading home run to Gavin Grahovac, and now you're kind of up against it a little bit. Maybe the nerves a little bit on the road, and you got to face Lavi Let and Montgomery in succession. I mean, this is murderer's row. I talked to Nolan Kane earlier this week, and he said, "Man, I mean, I don't. If there's another team that has four of these top hitters as good as we have, I don't know. Lavi Let followed by Braden Montgomery, and then Jackson Appel, and then Grahovac, and you saw what he can do. I mean, these guys can really swing the bat." Just takes the uh, inside corner. Two balls and a strike. And Montgomery and Appel are both switch hitters as well to add insult to injury. Bobby Ouellette watches it sail on the outside. Three balls and a strike. You know, if you hit 50 home runs in a career in college, I mean, that's impressive. That's big time stuff. Jace Lobby led has 33. And we're not even halfway through this his second year. Takes one right down the middle. Runs the count full. Sierra deals. Skies this one. Shortstop Dylan Cup. Circles underneath it and squeezes it one away. Got away with one there. A little lift. Talk about launch angle. That was serious launch angle from Jace. Lobby Lett gets up under it. I mean, that was a big league pop up to the infield. And it seems easy enough. But that is not easy. That ball is spinning and moving. Cup makes a nice play. Into an overcast sky, too. You mentioned Dylan Cup has been banged up these last couple of games. Back in the lineup at shortstop. Mershon then moving from short back to second his natural position makes them better defensively up the middle. Now Braden Montgomery. Sneary bounces it up there. Hey, you talk about five two players. This is one of them. Uh, hit for an average. Hit for power. 
elite running ability, big time arm strength, and can flat out go get him on defense. And those are the five tools that this kid possesses. And he is going to be a first rounder for sure. And we talked to Slos Nagel and we asked about him, and he said he's just a just an incredible human being as well. Understands the environment, asks how other people are doing. You know, just genuinely interested in the team and uh, the, the staff and everybody and he's just a just an all-around great kid according to Slosh. Yeah Slosh says he stays quote neutral unquote better than anyone he's ever coached doesn't get too high doesn't get too low stays in the moment. How about that? Sierra not afraid to go inside on Montgomery and strikes him out. And that's one of the reasons you see that Chris Lamonis trusts this kid on a Friday night. It's different than the rest of the, the, the games and the midweek games. Evan Sierra paints that ball in the inside corner on a, one of the best hitters in the country. And I thought it was a strike rate. Didn't agree with that. But either way, that's the second out. Brings up Jackson Appel, the catcher. A little bit low on that pitch, similar location. That one finds a strike, so it up in the zone. Ball and a strike. Interesting, Schloss referred to Appel as sneaky. And it's interesting, whenever you, Schloss, whenever he puts together this lineup, he says, a big part of it is protecting Montgomery, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and what that means is if, if you don't have a, 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 a big time hitter behind LaViolette and Montgomery, then they'll just walk Montgomery every time and, and pitch to this kid. But big job for Appel this year. Coming in at 375. Also switch hitter. Sierra deals. Foul back. You know, Chris Lamone has won the first national championship for Mississippi State in any sport in 2021. But since then, the injuries. I mean, he said seven out of ten pitchers were lost in 2022. Six out of ten and 23, and now Nate Dome. This is Nate Dome's spot tonight for Mississippi State. He's had a terrific year. He's been out. He hoped to get him back next week. This one has hit the straightaway center. Connor Hyzak has a beat on it and squeezes it. Playing on Saturday as well. Connor Hyzak will lead things off here in the top of the second in Mississippi State. Zach takes inside. <laughs> Isaac sends this one high to left field. Hayden shot coming in, squeezes it for out number one. That's the Ryan Prager effect. Even when you get behind 2-0, and oh, you feel a little pressure to get after that 2-0 pitch because you know you're not going to see anything more flat than that. And you see Heizak kind of reach out for that one. Quality pitch by Prager, but you feel as a hitter like you've got to really, you know, get after a, 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 an offensive count pitch. And you, you're less likely to be patient against a guy like Ray and Prager, and that's what makes Ryan so good. Left fielder Aaron Down steps in for the at, for a Mississippi State, and the Bulldogs sends this one a little bouncer to second base, charging on it and making the play is Caden Kent, and Ted Burton was able to get a foot on the bag for out number two. Yeah, what started out as a routine play is not that routine. I was told, I was a second baseman, I always told these second basemen to, to run toward the bag and flip it underhand. It's easier for either the pitcher or the first baseman to see it when you're charging a ball like that. But when you come over the top and you wing it, it's a very difficult play. Nice job by Burton just to hang on, and that's, Caden Kent, dad, uh, or his dad was Jeff Kent, played 19 years in the big leagues, five-time All-Star, so kid knows how to play second base. Ow, that can't his hurt. Foot stepped on that ankle, spiked. Right on the shin, yeah, the left side. Logan Kohler, third baseman, takes strike one. That's not that's something you don't want to ever happen, but you don't want it to happen in the 
top of the second inning, do you? You're, you got to be out there running on it all night long. Takes outside, two balls and a strike. Coach Lamone has talked about Kohler, and he's one of those players coming on. A lot of these players from Mississippi State are coming on, got off to a slow start. There's Coach Lamonis. A bunch of his players are starting to feel it a little bit. Logan Kohler, one of them. Pounds this one to second base. Again, Kent over to Burton. One, two, three, here in the second inning. Baseball conference in the country, the SEC. Ted Burton, first baseman, steps in. Made a couple of nice plays defensively in the top half of the inning. So he leads off the bottom half. Talk about this schedule. Coach Lamonis was talking about it. I mean, you start with LSU, then you go to A&M, and then you go to Florida, your first three series in the SEC. Man, that's brutal. Well, like we just talked about, it doesn't get any easier <laughs> for anybody, you know. Then they got Georgia, who got swept last weekend, but they're tough. I mean, what Charlie Condon's doing over there is like Nintendo RBI numbers. I mean, he's at 513 with 14 home runs. I mean, give me a break. Then Ole Miss, Auburn, Vanderbilt. I mean, it's any given week, it's, it's, uh, it's like a, a national championship series. It really is. Like, you, know, you think about how, how big of a series that was against LSU for – Mississippi State, you just you can't you can't really dwell on it, can you? I mean, you got to get right back out there because it's going to be equally as tough or tougher next week. Yeah, and we talked to Chris Lamont about that, and I think he was most impressed with how they handled the emotion of last week. You got the defending national champions coming in to Starkville. They win two out of three. His kids played well, and they weren't an overly uh, powerful offense. Um, but wow, that series is, they, they put a lot of numbers up on LSU. Sierra blows the fastball by Burton. A good start to this half inning for Evan Sierra. Could have won all three games too, Todd. If you think about it, look at the offense. Be plating 33 runs. That's a 368 average again against what I think is one of the best pitching staffs in the country. And they're still trying to fill it all out. But of course, you know, they get to Luke Coleman, the transfer from Alabama. He's been unhittable until he went into Starkville and they touched him up pretty good. They gave he got 10 hits off of him. Um, you know, and then Thatcher Hurd behind him. And uh, they've got some arms in Baton Rouge. And I think State really found out what they're made of last weekend. But you're right. Now to continue that week after week is the challenge. Shot gets this one off the end of the bat. Foul ball. Appel started a four seniors in a row through this lineup. Appel now Burton. Now you see Shot and Hank Barrett Bard behind him. Also, all four seniors in the middle of this lineup. High and away on the fastball. Two and two the count to Shot. Just missing that handcuff shot, too. Count goes full. Third full count for Sierra. The shot just stays alive. That's a good pitch. 3-2 with kind of the, the threat of walking him, and Sierra comes up with that little cutter down in the zone, pick something off of it at 83 miles an hour and shot out front. Typically as a hitter, you're looking for that dead red fastball, straight fastball. You get something else, it's hard to even make contact. Shot foul on this one back as he continues to battle. But as a hitter now at three and two, you don't know what Sierra's going to throw. So you're staying back. That's why that makes that 91 fastball a little more effective. By 
right into the shift. Mershon makes the play and throws out shot. Yeah, that's a good job of shifting over the right side. Of the Shot's a pull hitter anyway, but in an offensive count, it makes all the sense in the world to move guys to the right side. Used to be we would shift at the start of an at-bat. And now you're starting to see a lot of teams shifting based on counts, and especially later in counts. You get an offensive count against a big power guy. You move to that side, you got a better chance of getting him out. Now the DH, Hank Bard, steps in. Four lefties and two switch hitters in this lineup tonight for the Aggies. Now he just gets the bottom part of the strike zone. Gets away from Johnny Long. Two balls and a strike. Got the shift on again defensively. And you can see it. Mershon just out of your screen on the right. There he is. Yeah, I wouldn't call 2 1 necessarily an offensive count, but he's most likely going to get something off speed, which is very difficult for a hitter to go the other way with. And so the combination of the off speed threat and the fact that Bard is a pretty good pull hitter. He pulls this one to center field. Isaac is back to the track, makes the catch just before the wall. Hit hard, but the Duke get in, so that was kind of a big deal. They started the conference last year 0 and 7, so that's why winning two games against LSU this first weekend was big for them. And Johnny Long leading off this third inning. Slow bouncer to Grahovic and can't come up with it. E5, the call. Yeah, I think he took his eye off just a little bit. And, you know, I always said as an infielder, you know, slow it down in your mind. If he's safe, he's safe. But, you know, you got to make sure you catch the ball and then make the easy, nice transfer. You're quicker than you think you are. I always told these kids, you know, if you slow it down in your mind, you're going to be quicker with the baseball. But that can happen if you try to be too quick physically as well, uh, you know, and try to be too fast to get the guy. So Cup comes in to bunt him over and does an outstanding job on the first pitch. You see what Lamonis thinks is going to be this game. It's going to be close and tight and low scoring. Bunting in the third inning. Uh, it does turn the lineup over to the leadoff hitter, Amani Larry. So you got one, two, three coming up to try to tie this game. Larry takes ball one. Struck out in the first inning. You know his family, don't you? Yeah, they're right in my backyard here in Shreveport, of course. They went to Parkway High School in Bossier City, Louisiana, across the river, the Red River here. But Monty Larry's brother Gabe is also on this team. I had Gabe in the travel ball years ago. I mean, just talent to talent to group, both quarterbacks at Parkway High School. His sister Chloe hit a half-court shot about two weeks ago in the semifinal game of the state championship to down by two, Parkway. Chloe throws it up, makes it. They win by one and win the state championship. So talented town, the talented family. That's nuts. Isn't it crazy how sometimes how far the apple, you know, just doesn't fall, fall uh, far from the tree when it comes to siblings like that, the clutch gene? I mean, you know, yeah, it's one thing to be talented. It's another thing to have it, you know, when you're squeezed a little bit. And certainly Amani has it. Gabe can really swing it and then Chloe. Ted Burton's circles underneath this pop up. That's a big out, now two outs. Johnny Long standing on second. So it'll be up to David Mershon to drive in long with two outs.
Long takes his lead at second. High ball one. Yeah, you mentioned it earlier. I mean, David does have a lot going on, doesn't he? He's got the, the oven mitt in his back pocket. He's <laughs> got armor on the left foot. He's got yeah. armor on the left elbow. They say he plays with his hair cut on fire, and that's a lot of hair to catch on fire right there. That'd be, a, that'd be an inferno. <laughs> Double of it in the back. Yeah. It's amazing we got away without having those 20 years ago. The hoodie in the back coming right. out of the jersey. Leaving nothing to chance. Looks like what Willie Mays Hayes said many years ago. You look good, you play good. Whatever works. Yeah. He drives in long right here. Every, maybe everybody will have the, the uh, oven mitts. Both back pockets. <laughs> to right field. This one's going to get down. Long's coming home. Here comes the throw, and he's safe. Well, oven mitts all around. David Marshawn yep. delivers the first Pass him out. run for Mississippi State with a base hit to right field. Nice job staying inside this ball. Prager kind of throws that cutter coming in to the hands of David Marshawn who just pushes it out to right. There's a lot of base hits the opposite way. David Marshawn does a nice job of staying back, staying through it. And with two outs, Mississippi State's on the board. And as you pointed out in the first inning with his first at bat, when Bart Jordan comes up and there's a runner on base, a little bit different story for the pitcher. Well, I tell you what, after the first inning, Ryan Prager struck out four. You might have thought nobody was ever going to get a hit, but it yeah. quickly changed. They started touching him up in the second, and now here in the third, they've scored a run. Jason Mershon back. Jordan struck out on the first and reached on a wild pitch. That's why we had the four strikeouts. Prager. Prager deals. Jordan watches that one. Two balls and no strikes. This is not, especially with two and oh count to the hitter, but this is not a stolen base situation. You got the left hander. Uh, it's very difficult to, to steal on a lefty, and then you got your number three, Dakota Jordan. You don't want to leave him hanging for the next inning to start the next inning, so you want to let Dakota Jordan hit. Yeah. He tries to do just that and pats himself and says, yeah, I went chasing after that one, didn't he? Well, Jake Gotro is a hitting coach at Mississippi State. They got what they call the two-strike fight, which means they've got to about, you know, pump their chest and look in the dugout and make sure this is not with two strikes, but that's something similar saying, you know what? I'm going to fight a little harder this time. An acknowledgement. Off the end of the bat. May have caught his ankle a little bit on that one. Two and two. And there you saw him tap the Mississippi State logo. To say, I'm going to fight with two strikes. I love that. I always felt like I was a better hitter with two strikes. The energy level goes up. You, you know, you got a threat of striking out. So, you know, I spread out a little more, choked up on the bat, got the two-strike approach, and just put it in play. That's exactly what he does here. Off the third baseman's glove, and he can't find it. The Hovac couldn't find it. No, almost certainly be a base hit. And it is. And that's why Dakota Jordan's hitting 418. I mean, he almost had it, but by Grahovac, he just wasn't able to squeeze it. Ball lands right beside him, can't find it. But again, Dakota Jordan instead of striking out with a little bit of a longer swing that you might take earlier in account. He gets tight on that one and just puts the ball in play. And there's a lot of hits that way. So now two on for the red hot Hunter Hines. It's a tough at bat, lefty on lefty matchup. As a left handed hitter, the reason it's so difficult to hit left handed pitchers is because the ball gets on you a little bit quicker. Your reaction time is a little less. And just about every pitch that's coming out of Ryan Prager's hand is moving. 2 0 in the count. Yeah. 
First free throw to second base, chasing Mershon back. Mershon's at second, Jordan's at first. Pitch to Hines. That's what makes Ryan Prager one of the best. 2-0 and count. Just drops a slider on the outside corner when every hitter in the country is looking for a fastball down the middle. And now you don't know what he's going to throw. Here we'll find out. He has the same one. And that's why I talk about the educated guess process as a hitter. You have to have some indication of what's coming, you know, based on eliminating pitches, what he's got going, what he doesn't. But Prager throws so many different looks that it's hard to it's hard to get an educated guess on what's coming. And now with a 2-2 count, you basically have to eliminate the pull side, look up the middle the other way. Which is what he did. You try to pull it. Yeah, if you try to pull it, you're gonna be out in front. You're gonna swing and miss or hit a little dribbler to the right side. So lefty on lefty matchups, stay up the middle the other way, let the ball travel as long as possible so you can see it as long as you can. Short left field coming in, can't make the play. Now Shottle loses footing because of the rain. He wasn't going to get Mershon anyway, but a two out, two strike, RBI single puts Mississippi State on top. Well, you see the fight that they had with two strikes. I mean, Dakota Jordan had it, and now Hunter Hines does a perfect job of just staying inside the baseball, getting jammed with this slider. High slider gets jammed a little bit, goes the other way. Another base hit, three base hits in a row for Mississippi State. And they're, they're getting on Ryan Prager, one of the best pitchers in the country in this inning. Now it's Connor Isaac's turn. He sends it to right field. Playable. And Braden Montgomery makes the play. The Ole Miss and LSU each have won national championships since 2017. Pretty incredible. Mississippi State, one of the hottest teams in all of college baseball coming into this series. Took two out of three from LSU last weekend in Starkville. They won 13 out of their last 15, and they're up here 2-1 to one as we head to the bottom of the third. And Ali Camarillo, shortstop leading off for Texas A&M. One to third. Nice play by Logan Kohler. Throws him out at first. One away. Especially with the field being so wet. Saw even Kohler make a little bit of a, look like a little mini slip right there. Kind of make the play. But it's a very difficult play to be, be running in. And you kind of got to throw that ball up the right field line, have it tail back here on the run like that. It's a perfect play by Kohler for the first out. Saw a couple of the outfielders slipping and sliding in that last half inning, Todd. After all this rain, I mean, obviously you have the tarp on the infield, but they, they're going to water down that dirt, too, is high fly ball here off the bat of Caden Kent. An easy play for Dylan Cup makes it two out. Is it that much easier to keep your footing on the infield because the tarp has been on there, or is it still difficult because of just the general humidity of the area? No, the tarp covered all the dirt that you see and the grass on the infield. What they did was brushed all that water into the outfield. So now all of a sudden, and you've seen it in the past, they'll put helicopters in the outfield to kind of spread that water out. I don't think they did much tonight, so you got a lot of water out in the outfield. Now these, these stadiums have incredible drainage systems, so I mean, most of it's gone, but there still is some, some damp stuff out in the outfield, which makes, which makes it difficult for these outfielders to trust their footing. a and hitters aggressive in the bottom of the third inning. That's where Holback sends that one into the stands. Good crowd here tonight, too, considering we got off to a late start, half hour delayed, and all the weather in the area. We knew they weren't going to stay away from this series. Well, they ought to be excited about this team, too. 
I mean, 19 and two for Texas A&M. You mentioned in the open, won the first 17 games in a row. I mean, that's pretty impressive. Fun to watch too. Can beat you up and down the lineup, put a lot of runs on the board. Hovac wanted that one. Sierra just pulled. Hoping to squeeze it in right now. And the way these pitchers are pitching, we might get all nine innings in. Pitching duel through three innings, only four hits, three runs. And uh, we talked about the offense for both these group guys. I mean, this is two of the best offenses in the country. So credit to Evan Sierra and Ryan Prager on the mound so far tonight. They're doing a great job. Aaron Down steps in. Rounded out to second base in the second. Watches that fastball go by. Ahead of it. Again, the movement on that 2-0 fastball. Nobody on as a hitter. It's got to be a fastball right down the middle, right? And it's not. Instead, he takes something off of it, drops it out of the zone. He knows the hitter's going to be aggressive, swings right through it, and he does it again. 81 miles an hour. When you're, when, you're, when you're a pitcher, when you're a pitcher that can get swing and misses and offensive counts, you've got something special. And Ryan Prager's special. 12 That's swing foul. and misses so far in this game. Yes. Piece of Downs foot. Yeah, this one's cutting oh. in and right off the shin. That's why you see a lot of these hitters wear that shin guard for that reason right there. If it's coming That's... in at 81, it's going off your shin at about 101. And this time, Prager comes with the fastball, and after those two off-speed pitches, blows it right by him. First strikeout for Ryan Prager since the first inning where he had four in a row. Strikeout to Aaron Downs just up in the zone after the two cutters low and in. Change the eyesight of the hitter, and all of a sudden, you know, they'll get a swing and miss on that ball up in the zone. Train horn blowing in the background. Logan Kohler steps in. There it is, one of the cool parts about Blue Bell. You got the locomotive that'll come by several times throughout the course of a game, just beyond the right field fence. That one's hit hard on the ground to second base. Again into the shift. Kent throws him out, two away. Hitter's only hitting 174 against Ryan Prager. But the righties are really having a tough time. 148 coming into this game. And he just has the ability to bury that cutter low and into these right-handed hitters. And it's just very difficult to make solid contact. Right about the time you start looking low and in, he goes up and away. And it's just hard to figure him out. Bring up the catcher, Johnny Long. Reached on an error and scored last inning. We're going to talk to Chris Limonis coming up in the next half inning. Long lays off. Stance for long. Yeah, I really like that. I, I adopted that as well. That was part of a two strike approach that I ended up doing my entire at bat. What it does, it keeps your eyes still. To me, the most, one of the most important things about hitting is keeping your eyes still. Your eyes start bouncing around, the ball is going to bounce around. And then the trick is just the shift and getting enough power at the point of contact because you don't really have much movement with, with the step, you know, like most hitters do, the front foot. But once you he get that, just, yeah, he, he gets down like that, man. Such that a Bagwell-ish. Yeah. That is not a big strike zone. And he earns a walk. So Johnny Long reaches for the second consecutive inning, and it'll bring up Dylan Cup. 
sacrificed them over last inning. time cup couldn't catch up with it ball on a strike the only two freshmen on the field tonight Dylan cup right here the Georgia native Hitting out a nine spot for Mississippi State and Gavin Grohovac from Texas A&M again this day and age with transfer portal and everything else going on 24 year old kids playing college baseball it's tough for these freshmen to get on the field but it shows you how talented Dylan cup and Gavin Grohovac is or there's the whole back at third base. Prager trying to get out of the inning. He just misses. Much to the chagrin of the folks here at Bluebell tonight. They wanted to well, they wanted to walk off that one. The only place that could be is outside nine hole Dylan Cup. Prager certainly wanted it. Now he'll deal again this time with the count even. Bouncer to second. Kent will take it himself. Then we're here at Blue Bell. And Coach Lamonis joins us with the headset on. Coach, you have to be pretty happy with what you're seeing from Sierra. What do you uh, what what are you seeing and what do you hope to see here in the next couple of innings? Well, he's a you know a spot starter for us. So he's attacked the zone and um, he's made some really good pitches late too, which I, I you know he's been in a couple three two counts and, and got out of them. So um, hopefully, you know, he's got to get through this this lineup the second time here. Lim, it didn't start out good. Four strikeouts in a row, but you got to like the way your kids have gotten after Prager. Three base hits in the third, up two to one. Yeah, I don't know if we have a base hit over uh, 60 mile per hour, right? Exit Velo. <laughs> but we'll take him any way you can. He's really good, and that slider is uh, tough to get on right now. We're having a hard time with it. All right, Coach, thanks for your time. Thanks, guys. All right, Coach Lamonis and his Bulldogs up two to one. One well, more time with Sierra. You know, Todd, we were talking with him this week, and he said, you know, spot starter for Sierra. Really thinks he can do a great job one or two times through the lineup. So now that we're getting into the second time with these big hitters like Jace Laviolette, who lines one, but right to second baseman Mershon. Or I check that. It looks like Mershon maybe into the shift, but anyway, you get now these big hitters a second time around. How does that advantage shift to the hitters? Well, I always thought the more a hitter faced a pitcher, the more it becomes a hitter's advantage. You saw right there. He didn't miss the barrel lobby left. That's a bullet. So we'll see how this progresses. But he's got to like the way Evan Sierra has fought through the two times through the lineup, like you said. Now, uh, now going the second time through, we'll see how it goes. But again, uh, if you don't have elite stuff like 98, 99 miles an hour with a, with a big time slider, uh, a lot of stuff starts to get a little more flat. And if you can be patient as a hitter, you can get to him. Montgomery swings even in the count at one apiece, fouls it back. But you know, I, I love what Lamola said about the hitters. You know, I mean, one thing about a hitter to be good is you had to put your ego out the door, man. I don't have to hit a bullet every time up. And wow, and that is a bomb. Will it stay in the park? It will. Wow. To the deepest part, 400. <laughs> Connor Isaac was able to squeeze it. That went up into the night sky. As two of the best hitters in the country, but this is the stuff you start paying attention to. A bullet by Laviolette, and now Braden Montgomery misses a home run by uh, two feet. So uh, if, if they still start getting, you know, big time contact from Sierra, it's probably time to get the bullpen going. Uh, but uh, again, what I was trying to say is the hitters, they don't draw pictures in the, bull, in the book. So, I mean, for me, you had to throw your ego out the window, man. I'll take hits any way I can get them. And State's done a good job of scrapping these two runs across on the hits that they've got. Yeah, wind is blowing. We had the storms come through here earlier. And expect another front to, come, to move through late tonight. The wind right now is blowing just a little bit to left field. Not a strong wind, but that's where that's the direction it's heading. But you got that thick, moist air. You know, yeah. a little bit colder, cooler, and the wind dies down after a storm. So it, it becomes a little more difficult to hit. And 
Bell sends this one, will stay in play. No. That fence over there, kind of an awkward fence area when the padding starts. It's Coach Schloss Nagel, and Schloss will join us in the next half inning. But that's why I always thought as a hitter, if you could survive the first half of the season, if you, if you don't get tired, it ought to be a big year for you because the second half, the sun comes out, it's a little warmer, ball carries better. Uh, you know, you get more fans out. There's a lot of electricity in the ballpark, and I just, I just love the second half of the season. It's tough to get going as a hitter. The pitchers are always out front of the hitters early in the season, but as you go along, the hitters catch up. Sierra ahead in the count, just missing. Cuffed him with that inside fastball. He's retired 12. Head coach Jim Schlossnagel joins us right now. Head coach, uh, you were able to touch off this pitcher with the leadoff home run to start this uh, this game up, and then it's been uh, it's, it's been tough sledding. Uh, yeah, he's making good pitches. I mean, we've squared a couple ball, we've squared a couple balls up. Uh, uh, Jason Braden right there, uh, but crazy sport. You know, they put a three two out singles in play and which is what they do I think they had 30 last week so they, they fight you with two strikes that's for sure Slos Ryan started off hot four strikeouts in the first inning since then kind of cooled off a little yeah bit, I mean the air you know we, we, we had the we kicked the ball in, the, in that to lead off that one inning and then uh, he had they battled against him pretty good and ran that pitch count up so this is big inning right here top of the order all right thank you coach we'll let you get back to it all right see it all right coach Los Nagel and the Aggies Pitcher's duel to this point. Top of the order here with Imani Larry and the Bulldogs. Yeah, he said, he said it's a big inning for, for Prayer. The pitch count is getting up, but he's going one, two, three through this lineup. So he can get past Dakota Jordan without getting hurt, and he might be able to go another inning or two. Larry takes strike one. Strike two. I've noticed this time with both these pitchers that they've gotten behind in the count and they've both been able to battle back. To even up counts a lot in this game early. Well, the difference for Ryan Prager early, like the first inning, when he had that big inning, he was ahead of everybody. 0 2 1 2. And that's usually what he does. And you're right, over the last couple of innings, he's kind of fallen behind. But uh, he recovers there against the leadoff hitter, Amani Larry. That's a nice little change up on the outside part of the plate. And Amani Larry is not able to stay back. In the right hander, you're waiting for that cutter low and in. And so it kind of speeds up the barrel a little bit. So when he drops that change up on you, you're out front. Brings up David Mershon, RBI single in the third. Scored a run. First pitch swing, fouls it off the third base side. <laughs> fouls this one back 0-2. Todd, when you played, were you with the uh, stirrup showing, pants over the shoes, kind of the long pants? What was your look? Well, to your point, last at bat. If you get base hits, you know everybody's gonna start doing it. And and back when I played, of course, the the high, the high pants were below the knee. And nobody even thought to do it like football. You know, where you got it above the knee, which actually gives you a little more mobility. It's actually pretty smart. But I don't know if I love the look or not. But uh, now that was not something that we, nor the hoodie, nor the nor the just about anything going on right there. Well, whatever's working for Prager, maybe they'll start dressing the way Ryan Prager is because he struck out the first two batters he's faced here now in the fifth. Red start looked like he's getting his second wind. He had struck out Amani Larry and David Mershon to start the game in the first inning. 
Struck out Dakota Jordan as well, and here comes Dakota Jordan. But again, like I mentioned earlier, if he can get through this one, two, three, pitch counts over 70 now. Uh, he might be in good shape for a few more innings. Yeah, this is a big tipping point right here, isn't it? Well, it's good he got two outs. Again, you want Dakota Jordan coming up with nobody on because even if it's a home run, it doesn't hurt you very bad. And so you kind of freeze you up to make certain pitches to him. Even if you walk in with two outs, it's not the end of the world. This is low with the fastball. Jordan's been paying attention. Ryan Prayer doesn't throw anything flat 2 and 0, and all of a sudden he does. It fools you, and then you'll get a swing and miss. That one in the dirt. Yeah, it makes that jugs gun kind of deceiving sometimes, doesn't it? 91 miles an hour, but there's a, there's a, a difference. There's, you can be in a, a more effective 91 miles an hour. Well, especially if the hitter's looking for something else. When you've got them sitting on off speed, it makes that, that 90 look 96. Another off speed gets him chasing, full count. That, and that's my point. See, three and one, doesn't care if he walks him or not, so he's able to drop a slider on him. When everybody else in the ballpark thinks it's a fastball, and now you don't really know what he's going to throw. I would think he'd come back to the fastball once he thinks you're looking for that slider again. Gets him. Prager comes. Yeah, both these pitchers, Evan Sierra on the hill right now for Mississippi State, and Ryan Prager, as you saw in that last half inning, punching out the side, just sailing right along. Ted Burton trying to change that for the Aggies, and he takes strike one. Just turns on this one, but too much. Fouls it off. Two in the count. High ball one. What Evan Sierra is doing a good job of this week is he's attacking the zone. Over 60 pitches through four innings. Throwing a lot of strikes tonight. Last week against LSU. He got spanked a little bit. Only lasted three innings. Kind of danced around the zone. Tonight he's attacking the zone. And a little more confidence out there for that kid on a Friday night. Thursday night, but it's an opener for the series. Down the left field line, foul. You know, you mentioned it in the last half inning, even though it was a one, two, three inning, Lavi, Lett, and Montgomery both got good aluminum on the ball, and Burton just put a charge into that one. So, when I talked about the educated guess process, this is going to be a perfect example. You rip a fastball down the left field line, foul. So, as a hitter, now you come back to the plate and you're like, all right, I can eliminate that pitch, and I'm going to look off speed because he's got my barrel out in front. He thinks he can get me with something soft. And that's when I thought the best idea for a pitcher was to come right back in there. Let's see what Sierra does. He does come right back in there, and Burton fouls it off. So it's a whole thinking game between the hitter and the pitcher. You know, if I rip one foul with the fastball, now I think he's going to throw something off speed. If he throws something off speed and I'm late on it, then the next pitch is a fastball in, for example. Seventh pitch of this, of this at bat. Oh. <laughs> that's way in. Adding to Burton's guessing game. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, talk, we talked about the changeup being affected. This would be a good spot right here. Burton sends it right up the middle. That's a great at bat, isn't it? Well, it's a good at bat because he's out in front of the fastball and he knows it, so he tells himself, all right, I'm going to stay back. There's the changeup, a little too hard at 85 miles an hour. And. Uh, Ted Burton able to stay back and get a piece of it. That changeup needs to be a little softer in the 70s 
for velocity and lower in the zone. If he does that, he can get a swing and miss. But when you leave it up in the zone at 85, it's going to get it's going to get turned around. Yeah, 85 change with a 91 fastball. It's just that you've got to have that differential, don't you? Yeah, and, and again, the hitters have been teeing off on that changeup. Stevens fires his last warm-up pitch, and we're ready to go with Ted Burton standing over on first base. First base runner that AM has had. I mean, you think about it. Grahovac leads off the game, the bottom of the first anyway, with a home run, a solo shot. Then had anybody reach base. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Again, on a night when he, when he thought there'd be a lot of hits. Really hasn't been much at all, especially from AM's lineup. Stevens immediately misses inside. Just really difficult to try to pull a left-handed pitcher as a left-handed hitter. I was a left-handed hitter, and so to start it at bat, I always looked up the middle the other way. I, I eliminated the pull side, which allowed me to stay back, take the balls, and if it was in the zone, I did my best just to get get a barrel on it. If you get ahead in the count, two and zero, oh, three and one, then you can try to get the barrel out and try to pull it. But up till that point, if you try to pull it early, that's what happens. You're way out front of the sliders, and you just have no real shot. And he'll keep feeding them to you when you're swinging and missing. Yeah, did you find that pitchers, left-handed pitchers, were more apt to come inside, were, were, were more comfortable coming inside on you? No, 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 not at all. They don't want to hit you, especially in this situation with nobody gotcha. out. So I always thought that they were afraid to come inside, even at the high level. And mm -hmm. for the most part, they weren't really practiced on that. Uh, you know, the lefties in the big leagues, throw cutters away and sliders away. Yep. And, and as a hitter, you had to look to left field or you had no chance. Well, that's where Johnny Long was set up. Caught too much of the plate, though. And back-to-back -back base hits as a and in business. Difference is in the high level, they're more apt to hit their spots than in college. And so in college, you can get away with that. And I mean, hand it to Hayden Shot, who sticks with his game plan. He's going to pull it. And that ball's right down Broadway. Hayden Shot with a bullet to right field. And first and second, a and finally has something going in this game after the home run, like you mentioned, the lead off the game. Just a quiet sense, but now two straight base hits here in the fifth. And another lefty coming up to bat, Hank Bard. And Tommy just misses inside with the fastball. Students taking an opportunity to make a night of it on a Thursday night. Imagine that. Inside again. It's one of the louder ballparks in the country. Now it's half full because of the rain and the wind and all that. But man, this thing can get electric. You know, I had a regional here a couple years ago. And, uh, it's as loud as anywhere in the country. Time to get behind Hank Bard. Out, two balls and no strikes. Got the ship to the right side, so you got to be careful about putting the ball on the ground and hitting the double play. When you're in an offensive count, this is when you started hunting the fastball. Taking that fastball off the inside corner, 3 0. Yeah, now you work the count. So now it opens it up. Now all of a sudden, the full side is in play. Now clearly he won't swing on this pitch at 3 0. He wanna, he's going to hurt himself. He's going to let him hurt himself. But at 3 and 1, he's got to throw at the same pitch, 3 and 1. And that's when he just kind of shoots. But again, you got to be careful this that cutter you, on the ground. If you know that pitch is coming, why don't you just sit on that pitch, Ty? Like that, that last pitch. If you know it's coming, there, for me, he's got to throw the same pitch here. So there was no reason to get yourself out on three and zero. Gotcha. If you were, if you were, if there was no threat of you striking out, which means you were pretty confident against the pitcher that you weren't going to swing and miss with two strikes, I'd take this one too. 
Make him throw three strikes in a row because three two would be the same as three and one. But right here, he ought to get that same pitch. He's got it timed up. Foul ball. He took a hack at it. Yeah, a little too anxious. Yeah, a little too far out front. That's what can happen as well. There's a lot of times as a hitter that you're not sure of yourself and you can be defensive, but there's also such a thing as being overconfident. And in three and one, it's, it's what makes hitting so difficult. Even when you know it's coming, uh, it's hard to time it up. And now he's going to get the same pitch again at three and two. Gets away from the catcher. It's ball four. Long gives chase, and well, they, thought, they thought about it, but instead Burton back on the bag at third, and they're loaded with nobody out. Yeah, and as a hitter, when I'm thinking I'm going to get that same pitch, three and one and three and two, I, I just, it's not smart. So two guys on, nobody out in a tight game, and he throws a non-competitive pitch that walks Hank Bard. Now it is eight, nine, one coming up, so you've got eight hole Camarillo with the bases loaded, but I mean, hitting's too difficult. You're going to give up a run for an out, especially playing the double play. And you're just hoping that Nolan Stevens can get ahead. If he falls behind again, he's got to throw that fastball in there. It might be trouble. Uh, Camarillo, the transfer from Cal State Northridge, is in his third year. Had some big years over there. Stevens opens up behind in the count. Big spot for a freshman. On the road, crowds getting into it, bases loaded, nobody out. Framed up nicely by Long behind the plate, gets a strike. Yeah, it's a quality inside pitch, but the 1 0 is an offensive count there, too, because now you got bases loaded. He just struggled with the hitter before. He throws ball one, so you know a fastball's coming. Now you're a little unsure. And now you know he doesn't want to go three and one. So now, again, as a hitter, you're thinking, here comes the fastball. Two and one, bases loaded, nowhere to put him. It is the eight hole hitter. And so at this point, Stevens has to challenge him. So if you're Camarillo, you get geared up for that fastball. Foul it back. Big swing from Camarillo. Yeah, now you don't know again. What I used to do at two and two right here is if you looked out there and the pitcher shook his head three or four times, he's trying to fool you into thinking you're throwing something off speed. He's coming back with the fastball. But if he acknowledged the signal right away, that told me as a hitter it would be something off speed. But again, he doesn't want to get to three and two because the three and two pitch has to be grooved right down the middle. Two two. And Mario fouls it off. That was quality. Took something off of it at 85 miles an hour, just enough to get Camarillo out front. This is the part if you're Stevens, there's still a little bit of doubt in Camarillo's mind at two and two. And I think you got to just pump the fastball in there. Because you get to three and two, there's no doubt left. Stevens deals inside. That's where we're at, three and two. And this is the part of the hitter where you got to take a few deep breaths, calm your nerves, get the timing right. Because you can get jumpy, get out front, and roll over into a double play. You gotta stay through it. Up the middle. Isaac back. Can't make the play. And Ryan Targot steps in with him loaded and want nobody out. An aggressive first pitch swinging on a pitch out of the strike zone. And they're trying to use him in certain spots to get him going again. You see the batting average down low, but Targas has been a big part of this, this organization or this school for the last few years. And as a pinch hitter, that's what you do. You come out aggressive, and Stevens knew that. Drops a curveball on him first pitch. Now he's behind 0-2. They gave Camarillo a base hit there to center field, so 
Three base hits and a walk to start the fifth. Mississippi State. Got him swinging. That's a big strikeout for Stevens as we go to the top of this order. Yeah, huge. And no fastballs. That's a way to attack a pinch hitter. He's coming off the bench a little cold and sitting for an hour and a half. And as a pinch hitter, you know you got to come up aggressive, and that's what Targosh did. But Nolan Stevens kind of neutralizes that with a bunch of off speed. Now Grahovac, first ball swinging. Homered in the bottom half of the first inning. To put AM on the board early. But struck out in the third. Hits this one deep to left field. That's a carbon copy from his first inning home run, but this one's a grand slam. Doubter for the leadoff hitter Gavin Grohovac. Remember, only a freshman. I mean, that ball is stung as far as you can hit it for the freshman. And wow, what a difference one inning makes. Two base hits, a walk, a base hit, strikes out the pinch hitter Targotch and turns the lineup over to Grohovac with his second home run of the game. And now you know these hitters behind Grahovac want to eat. And Jace Laviolette is next. How quickly things can change. You you brought it up. I mean, a uh, and done nothing outside of Grahovac's first inning home run. And he was the leadoff hitter after that. Just... Bring him up, sit him down all the way to this inning in the fifth. Where Ted Burton, the 5 holes hitter, gets the base hit to lead off. Then you got lefty lefty matchups. Shot and barred both. Get on base. And it kind of backfires to bring in the lefty Nolan Stevens. Five runs in this fifth inning for Texas AM. God love you let though. That's another big strikeout as he had just tattooed that last foul ball. Yeah, you would think if everybody else is doing work in this lineup, you would think two, three, and four, their best hitters would really put the nail on you. Well, have you let strikes out, but now Braden Montgomery. Switch hitter. Yeah, those three hitters 0 for 7 combined to this point. Let's see what Montgomery can do from the right side. In fooling too many people with that fastball and trying to get it through the heart of this lineup with that with that fastball is going to be tough. Ray Montgomery, I only think keeping that ball in the ballpark, he hit it too solid straight through the left side and with two outs, AM still rolling. This inning's choking me up, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering where you went. It's too much. Well, I know Mississippi State feels the same way. Yeah. Well, I feel this. And Hunter Hines steps in for the Bulldogs. Prager still hurling for AM. Prager, you've just been sitting for a little while, but obviously you're 
overjoyed by seeing your offense put some crooked numbers on the board. But now you got to get back out there and kind of refocus. Yeah, yeah. Right up under 30 minutes in that half inning. And to be able to come out and just immediately get ahead of hitters is pretty impressive. But, you know, we heard Jim Slosnagel talk about the fifth for Prager. That was going to be huge for him. And one, two, three for Mississippi State. He strikes them all out. So Prager back on track. High to Hines and even to count at two and two. It's one of Mississippi State's hottest hitters coming in. Yeah, this is where you want a home run hitter to be, though. A leadoff guy with nobody on. Hunter Hines, three home runs versus LSU last weekend. He's top 10 active players in home runs with 42. Gives this one a ride to straightaway center. Laviolette goes back to the track and makes the catch just before the wall. Yeah, it's kind of dead air out there, especially to center field. That's the biggest part of the ballpark, obviously. Not much wind, you know, cold, dense air. It's tough to get it out of here right now, unless you're Grahovac and you get the barrel out in front and pull it. And left field is the spot. If you're going to pick a field to get the benefit of any of the wind tonight, it is left field. Connor Isaac steps in. 0 for 2 on the night. A couple of fly outs to the outfield. Another opportunity for LaViolette. Two put outs in the inning. Just like that, there's two outs. Yeah, at this point for Ryan Prager, he'd almost want early contact. Stay in the game. Keep that pitch count down now at 84. Aaron Down steps in. First pitch swing straight back. a pitching duel with a grand slam in the fifth from that man Grahovac and they hold a 6-2 lead. I think that the grounds crew that was out there beyond the left field wall is still chasing after that ball. Oh it was crushed. That went a long way and now they're staked with this 6-2 lead. Stevens comes back up there right up the middle for a base hit. Jackson Apple opens things up here in the sixth. Sit straight back up the middle. And Aggie's offense continues. You now back to Ted Burton, who got it all started in the last inning with a base hit to lead it off. Plays off strike one. This one hard to shortstop. Could be two. Over to second for one. And they turn it. Now, picture perfect there by the state defense. But wow, no one Stevens needed that in the worst way. Not missing too many barrels in the last inning. And two thirds. That's what makes this game so difficult, Chris. He was on top of the world last week, freshman of the week. Dealt against the national champions, LSU. Comes out in this one and just it's been tough for Nolan Stevens. Yep. Like you said, every weekend, it's going to be a battle. Doing well 
to get ahead of Hayden shot here. Shot skies this one to left field. Downs under it. And he's able to squeeze it. Field in the sixth. Ryan Prager's been very good. I mean, the numbers for him have just been incredible. Undefeated this year, 4-0. Opponents only hitting 174 off of him. Gave up his fourth, only his fourth walk tonight. 41 strikeouts coming into this game. Now he's close to 50. The strikeout to walk ratio off the charts for Ryan Prager. The 20 swing and miss strikes tonight as well. And Logan Kohler tried to get on board with a leadoff walk. Instead, he rounds one to second. Easy play for Ryan Tarkoch. Went away. And then just when the lightning comes, like the weather tonight, it kind of goes away. Things start settling down again. And seven straight, eight straight outs for Ryan Prager in this lineup. That was Camarillo made the throw in the shift. Brings up Johnny Long, the catcher. Scored one of those two runs for the Bulldogs after reaching on an error in the third. Well, we talked about how hot this state offense has been, too. 50 runs in the last four games, and that's including the three-game series with LSU. Now he's trying to bump one on and just put it right in the right spot. Gets on. You kind of like this kid's approach to the plate. He's hitting out of the eighth spot, but, I mean, doesn't strike out a lot. Knows how to play. That's a tough bunt to the right side. But if you see the defense giving it to you, Square up, be still, be under control, and don't get anxious about it. Put it in a nice spot. You get yourself a base hit. All smiles in the dugout. Now he hands the ball to Josh Stewart. Dylan Cup, the bottom of this Mississippi State order. And long at first. Snap throw to first behind the runner. Long gets back. speed away here Todd off speed away yes well he loves to use his slider and you got the nine hole Dylan Cub you can't mess around with him too much it is the nine hole hitter you want to attack him got him but when you know you, you only know if you're in the box but clearly that slider's got tight spin on it looks like a fastball down the middle and once you start attacking it it goes out away from the barrel and Dylan got really no chance right there If you can see the spin on it makes it a little less difficult because then you can follow it, stay back and hit it the other way. But if you can't, looks like a fastball, it's almost impossible. Back to the top of this Bulldog order, and Amani Larry, 0 for 3 with two strikeouts. Side corner, ball and a strike. Yeah, once you start showing that hitter that pitch on the outside corner, with if you're Amani as a hitter, all you know to do is just follow it, go the other way. You can't pull that pitch. Is when he'll start attacking you inside with a fastball at 95. Amani does go the other way and just sends a little number to right field. That'll get down for a base hit and long. Will make his way to third base. So a little something going here with two outs for the Bulldogs. Yeah, you got to be real careful on the bases down by four late in the game if you're Mississippi State. There's a slider just getting away off the end of the bat. Cue ball. 
off to the right side. Amani Larry gets away with one and first and third with two outs, but you're basically going station to station. So you saw a pickoff to try to get Johnny Long. He wasn't trying to steal, he just tried to catch him napping. And so if you're the runners now, I'll make sure that you don't get picked off or do anything crazy down by four in this game. Now Mershon will sp sl switch sides. Pounds this one right into the turf. Foul. Mershon switch hitter. Hit from the right side. First two at bats, first three at bats. Go over to the left side. 435 with runners in scoring position. You see that 17 RBI number. Yeah, he can handle the bat. But Josh Stewart's slider is so effective that against right handers, it moves away. And against left handers, it buries it low and in. And about all you can do as a hitter if he puts it in the right spot is to bounce it in the ground. Yeah, right first two, first two attempts there. Yeah, and so that's why the thing about the shift is you got to pitch to it. You know, with that slider barreling in on a left hander, why would you not shift? Because there's no way if you can get in there tight enough that Mershon's going to be able to hit it to the left side. You don't really shift on in first base and hold them on. So there's a lot of gaps on that right side, but you would think this would be the time to do it with two outs. Got him. That inside slider. Got him. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I thought there were a few of them tonight. Arkansas Auburn. Yeah, I think Arkansas Auburn's definitely tonight. Bama at Georgia, Ole Miss at Tennessee. <laughs> Stevens back out there for another inning of work for Mississippi State. Hank Bard, the DH. Heading the count, two balls and a strike. Stevens trying to eat a few innings here in this one, the opener of this three game set. Keep Mississippi State within striking distance in the later innings. There's Coach Lamonis. Back, saw Coach Lamonis there. It's a good conversation with him this week, Todd, about just how big it was to beat your rival LSU and take two out of three from them at home. Big crowds they had last weekend, but then the task turns to Monday where you've got to make sure everybody's grounded and not too excited about it because you've got a road trip to AM this weekend. Bard flies out to left field. You're right, Arkansas Auburn, the only other game going on tonight. But I, I always get confused on talking about Friday nights because, yeah, we start the Thursday night schedule, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It's staggered. And as the season goes on toward the end, they all start on Thursday night. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I told you earlier, too, you almost get spooked by the teams that are struggling in the SEC when you have to play them in week five or six because everybody's good. And so on any given weekend, they can play well. And, of course, you see it right here with Texas A&M. Who started out 17 and 0 and then lost two or three at Florida. The interesting thing about last week for the SEC is every home team won their series, all seven. So the home team definitely has an advantage here, and Aggies needed to take this one for sure at home. Yeah, they're off to a good start tonight. Up 6-2 on Los Las Nagels Club. Took the one run lead in the first inning. Mississippi State came back with a couple in the third. And AM's big fifth, highlighted by Gavin Grahovac's second home run of the night, a grand slam in the fifth, providing the differential. Camarillo, foul, just foul. Third base on part, Jason Johnson on top of that, just barely to the left side. Shows a little dexterity too down there. Get out of the way of it. <laughs> Go 
it's a loud strike. Camarillo now 0-2. It's a shortstop. Cup up and throwing. Just gets it by a half step. Yeah, you always hear guys on the left side have to have cannons for arms. That's why. You don't charge the ball. You stay back a little bit. you got to be able to throw a bullet and on the money to first base. Nice job by Cup. Gathered himself. And he fired that ball across. He got dinged up a little bit, but Friday night in that game against LSU. He missed the last two of that series and Tuesday night's game with Memphis, so good for the Bulldogs to have him back, especially from a defensive, from a defensive standpoint. Have him at short. You can then move Mershon over to second. Yeah, he bruised his right knee a little bit on a dive in that LSU series, and he's back out there. Think about baseball, especially when you get the higher levels, you're playing every day, so you're almost always playing with some sort of minor injury, and that's what makes it even more difficult. This game's hard enough. We call it a failure sport, and you got to fight through it all. Yeah, we've seen all these little things tonight, like player getting his ankle stepped on, fouling one off his shin. Stevens has settled in a little bit here. He got roughed up in that fifth inning. But since then, if he can get Targotch here, he won't face the minimum in the last two innings. Well, he's young, and the most important thing for him is he's getting experience on weekends. Somebody they can use for the next at least two years to come. Talked about it earlier with Dome being injured, all the injuries they had last year, this pitching staff. That's always something that rears its ugly head, it seems. Well, Chris Lamonis would never use that as an excuse, but I mean, I mean, they were ready to put a statue out in front of the stadium for him. You know, winning the national championship in 21. Has Landon Sims, one of the best pitchers in the country, coming back for 2022. He gets hurt, tore, tore muscle right off the bone. It's not his fault, but he's had a lot of injuries, and now Nate Dome. But uh, like you mentioned, Nolan Stevens doing a good job here. Of course, swept Missouri last week, so they're four and zero. Oh. And when we talk about Ryan Prager being one of the best in the country for Texas A&M, Arkansas has Hagen Smith. I mean, did you see what he did to Oregon State a few weeks ago. First yeah. 15 outs were all strikeouts. I mean, this kid he can beat anybody in the country as well. It gives Arkansas a real shot this year. Yeah, he's special. No question about it. We saw Florida State and Clemson, too. That's a big one in the ACC. Florida State, one of the big surprises of the early going. Dakota Jordan, Mississippi State. Got to get something going here in the top of the eighth. No better man to get you started than this man right here. Yep, there's the two-strike fight tap. And one and two, he's going to need at least sliders coming from Josh Stewart or Nasty. Lays off that one outside, two and two. Got him. Again, you don't really know until you're actually in the box, but just watching these hitters respond, I mean, they just can't pick up the, the, the spin on that slider. And for Dakota and Jordan, you see him brush back. He thinks it's a fastball in. Goes right down the middle of the play, a little bit low, but right there. And again, you're talking about a 400 hitter and a guy that's done it for two years now, Dakota Jordan, and that's his third strikeout of the game. Again, gets ahead of the hitter. This time it's Hunter Hines. Hines lifts this one to left field. Will it carry enough? It will. Hines continues his recent toward streak with a home run himself, cutting this AM lead to three. 
That's a place to hit it left field for Hunter Hines. Yeah, one of the best active home run hitters for career playing in college baseball. Pops one out of the four spots to left field. And if you're going to be a big home run hitter, you got to be able to hit it the other way as well. Hunter Hines does a nice job. Four home runs in the last week for that kid. Connor Isaac now takes strike one on the outside corner. He gets a hold of one. Down the left field line. That'll go for extra bases. And he'll roll into second base with a stand-up double. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Josh Stewart's tired, but he's starting to get a little loose with that slider, leaving it up in the zone. That ball was up near Connor Isaac's eyes. Not much spin on that one. You saw the break he had when he struck out Dakota Jordan. That one much different. Didn't fool Connor Isaac. Rips it in left field for a one-out double. He's just like the designated pitcher. Like You're going to see him this weekend. It's just a matter of when and how often. Yeah, in college baseball, you get a little bit about that, too. There's no designated role. Sloss talked about being an all-time, all all-moment pitcher for Evan Oshenbach. You know, he's kind of a chameleon. He can start for you. He can middle relief or he can close, but he's got big-time stuff. Well, Stevens challenging the hitter coming out of that visit on the mound. Yeah, sometimes it just takes a little bit of, you know, mental energy just to slow down a little bit, you know, gather gather a little strength back and then keep doing what you're doing. He's been electric with that slider outside the last two hitters. That uh, downs. Crowding the plate, not offering at it. Ball and two strikes. Gets it in the air. An easy put out for Camarillo. He makes it. Drop the change up. It's easier to see. So you can see a lot of cutters away and sliders. Which I, what, like I said, it was hard as a left handed hitter to look pool early in the count, lefty on lefty, because you know what he's trying to do. Hit that outside corner. He could possibly make a mistake, but at the higher levels, they usually don't. And you just got to be able to, like you've always heard in baseball, hit it where it's pitched. Gets away from Appel. Isaac move up 90 feet. And that's a wild pitch. Two here, Austin Beck's concern is Kohler at the plate. And Kohler lays off. Well, he waved at two of them, so Austin Beck said, well, I might as well try to see if he'll go again, but nice job by Kohler kind of catching on to the sequence here. can't catch up with the high heat. Well, you're not going to because it's a one-two count. You're looking slider, so you're going to sit back, and that's when that fastball becomes effective like that. And the best you can do as a hitter is just somehow try to pull it and play. When I, you know, when you, you say you got to be quick with the swing, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to pull it. You just got to be looking off speed so you can sit on something like that, but be able to react and be quick enough on the fastball when he throws it. Kohler battling back in this at bat to get the count even at two apiece. And we saw Isaac at third. Got him. Driven in five of the six Texas A&M runs. And he leads off this eighth inning with the Aggies up 6-3. 
Stevens back out there throwing from Mississippi State. He's going to get a one pitch out here, ground out to second. So a good start for Stevens, who's settling in a little bit after that rough outing coming out in the fifth inning and not being able to shut the door on the Texas A&M bats. But sixth inning, seventh inning, faced the minimum in those two innings, and now gets an out here in the eighth. Yeah, he's showing flashes of his, his talent level again. Big week last week, comes in, gives up a little bit of damage in the fifth, but you're right, settled down. Got the double play ball in the sixth. Sent him down one, two, three in the seventh. Now the first out and a big out, a leadoff hitter here in the eighth. I don't know what Chase Laviolette is. This conversation with home plate umpire Brandon Bennett is. Now we're going to get Schlossnagel coming out. Just wants clarification on something. Down 0 2. Let's had a night to forget a couple infield pop ups and a strikeout looking in the fifth. Pounds this one into the grass. Covering on the play and they get him. Stevens was able to just get over. Yeah, that's pretty good by Stevens. Anytime that ball is rolled to your left side, you know immediately as a pitcher you got to go cover and he's got to find the bag, catch the ball, and do all that all at once. And Barely gets Chase Bobby Lett at first base. Good call by David Savage, our first base umpire. Yeah, he got there. Barely. Yeah, you got to sprint, don't you? Mm. Just put that head down. Yeah, that's the play when, as a runner, they always told you like to kind of step in front of the bag. You know, you don't want to put that foot on top of the bag. It costs you time. So if you're Bobby Lett right there, and they're going to challenge it. You're running, and as you're running, if you know it's going to be close, you just step right in front of the bag and maybe it was still a base hit in a situation like that. That's old school prior to video replay, right? Base has been confirmed. Yeah, he was out by just a bit. Yep, a quick there. review of it. Yep, see how he stepped on. His left foot goes halfway on top of the bag. Now Montgomery swings through that first Stevens pitch. Reached on a single in his last at bat, but was picked off at first base. Hits that one hard in the hole on the left side. Yeah, this is actually good news for Schlossnagel and the Aggies. I mean, if you got Laviolette and Montgomery now with his second base hit of the game, but if you've got these guys really not participating much in the offense where you scored six runs, that's pretty impressive. That means the supporting cast is doing their job. The two guys we highlighted at the beginning as the two of the best hitters in the country really hasn't done a whole lot tonight, but the Aggies still managing. To get six runs. Yeah, Jackson Appel coming up. He's one for three. Got to hit his last at bat. Cut down in a double play. Squares the bunt. Pulls it back. Ball and a strike. Got him picked off, and they'll get him at second base. So for the second time tonight for Texas A&M, and Bryce Chance will pinch it to lead things off for the Bulldogs. Yeah. 
Eschenbach ahead. The ball and no strikes. To left field, that's going to drop for a base hit in front of shot. So Chance, Spice Chance gets a pinch hit base hit to keep the Bulldogs' hopes alive. There's no better feeling than being one for one when you've been sitting for three hours. How about Chance off the bench gets a low inside cutter and kind of loops it into left field for a base hit. Brings up well, the shortstop better, Dylan Cup. There's better feelings, but that's pretty good. That's up there. That's up there. You'll be feeling even better if you could somehow get around to score and in Mississippi State make a game of this in the ninth. Yeah, well, again, you just got to, with the lefty on the mound, you got to make sure that he goes to the plate. Don't get picked off or do anything silly. Cup up the middle. This could be two. One and two. That's what that cutter does for Evan Aschenbeck. Just every pitter that goes after is going to drill it in the ground. And Got to make sure that ball gets up. The 9 old Cup just beats it to the shortstop. And quickly, two outs here in the ninth. Back to the top of the order with Amani Larry. One for four on the night. And he takes strike one. Takes high and away. Two balls and a strike. Yeah, I'll show you 91 with that flat fastball, but he's coming with the cutter. And what's made, made Evan so good is he's able to keep it low. And there's nothing you can do with it at the hitter except beat it in the ground. Caught the outside corner. Mississippi State down in their last strike. Rounder to second base. Targas throws him out, and Texas A&M has taken the open.